So yeah, can you make Jared welcome to our How are we feeling today? Fresh. Fresh. Fresh hot. Huh? We will keep this, we're going to keep big picture stuff today. So I, I think over the next, so far as I understand it, over the next year you're going to have a lot of sessions that go into specific strategies, details. Did it not work out? Yes. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> 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 Is it okay if I just keep going? Just press that button once more. Okay. This is what. Don't lose the mojo. Just go for it. Sweet! I love it. My goal, so eventually you're gonna you're gonna be learning, and this is kind of gonna be your career now as teachers. A lot of specific strategies. Win X, do Y, win X, do Y, and that's awesome. What I try and do is sit behind all of that. And I'll explain why in a second. So first of all, let's start here. Who the hell is this guy? Which button do I press? It? Oh no, it doesn't work. I might have to pull this guy. I no. Why didn't it work? Oh, it sucks. Boy, this is 0 for 2 today. I'm gonna hang out over here most of the day if that's alright. I started out as a teacher, and I was right around. I was I was teaching when the brain stuff started to get really kind of sexy. So you guys, how many people have come into your class or talked to you or sold you a book on the brain? Because the brain is, once we know the brain, we're going to know everything. I'm the only one. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> that was happening at my school. And I just, I remember asking these people left and right. They'd come in and sell us this brain stuff. And I'd say, what in the hell are you talking about? What does any of this actually mean? And no one could give me an answer. So I figured out the only reason, the only way I'd be able to sort it all out would be to go back and learn it myself. Um, so I went back to school. I went to, um, this would be the only time I drop it. Harvard University. <laughs> That's correct. I'm gonna just throw that in. Every 30 minutes, I just say it. No. So I went there to start. I got my master's there and started my research on the brain there. Um, came down to Melbourne because I met a lovely lady, born and bred in Melbourne. So I finished my PhD over at UniMel, and the whole thing I've done is try and figure out what good is the brain for us as educators. My entire purpose in doing the last eight years of my life was so I could get here today to say. Here's what this means. Here's how we can use it. And it's big picture stuff. So here's where I like to start generally. Oh, here's the one thing I found out. If you ask a neuroscientist about teaching, and they even call themselves educational neuroscientists, here's what they think. They know more than you. They think they know more than anyone really in the world about everything because they get the brain. It's so important for me that we fight against this. Bullshit stuff. I'm sorry, I swear every once in a while, and I'm gonna try my best not to, but if it happens, throw something at me. Also, I'm totally easy. If something doesn't make sense, or you hate something, or you wanna push back, or you wanna throw something, do it. It's so much more fun when we all do this stuff together. I wanna start you with a question, just something to think about as we get going. Here's what I'm gonna do. Chefs combine flavors to create unique and memorable dishes. Yes? Flavors are mediated by receptors on the tongue. Therefore, it stands to reason, in order to be an effective chef, you need to understand how tongue receptors work. True or false? False. What? Does anyone want to battle? Anyone want to say true? Why is it false? Why is it absurd? There's lots of good tests being done in my head. How long have we had incredible chefs? How long have we understood how the tongue works? I'll give you a hint, we have no clue how it works. There's two senses that we just don't get, one of them is taste. We have no clue. What we do know is that, you know how you have different taste receptors on different parts of your tongue? Yeah, that's bullshit. That's not true. <laughs> So, this is an absurdity. You can be an effective chef without knowing how the tongue works. What is the chef's stock and trade? What do they really care about? If they're not caring about taste receptors, what is their main tool? What do they play with? Food, protein. Food, flavors, tastes, all of them. That's what they play with. 
The very fact that food can be taste is enough for them. They don't need to know how it's happening because they're playing with the tastes themselves. Question two. Painters create incredible art to move and inspire human beings. We're going to say paintings. Paintings are mediated by receptors on the back of the eyeball. Therefore, it stands to reason, in order to be an effective painter, you need to understand how the eyeball works, true or false? False. Oh, why is that absurd? Because if you can see it, you can understand it. The fact that we see it is enough. How long have we had great painters? How long have we understood how the eye works? Still working on it. I'll get back to you in a couple of years. Here's where things get tricky. Are you ready to feel a little uncomfortable? Perhaps. Teachers combine ideas to convey meaning and purpose in students' lives. Ideas are mediated by neurons within the brain, therefore it stands to reason in order to be an effective teacher, you need to understand how the brain works. How many people say true to this? That's okay. How many people say false? How many people recognize that this is the exact same question we just had twice? And if questions A and B are absurd, this has to be absurd. How long have we had incredible teachers? Let's go back to Socrates. Let's go back to Plato. Let's go back in the day. We have had thousands of years of incredible teachers. How long have we understood how this works? We, I assure you, we're not even close. We're not even 1% to figuring out how this thing works. You're absolutely right. Why does this feel like it should be true, though? I mean, it does, this is why I spent eight years figuring this thing out. <laughs> it feels right. Once we know this, then we can teach our students. Huh. If the first two are absurd, that has to be absurd. But can I explain that to you? Can we prove it? And this is, I love it or hate it, so I'm, a, I'm technically considered an educational neuroscientist. <laughs> and one, any book that I write, anything I do, the first thing I say is educational neuroscience is a non existent term. It's nonsense. And to understand why, all you have to do is understand these birds here. Or these birds here. Oh, why are you going to play? Oh, give me one second. My, com my computer must just hate this plugin. That's alright. I want you guys to see this video. Give me a second. I'm going to just play a few off of this file. I might have to go digging into my files, but that's all right with you. <laughs> this one is right here. Once you understand these guys, you understand everything you need to know about neuroscience and education. That's pretty awesome, right? That's gorgeous. Has anyone watched the new Attenborough Planet Earth 2? Oh, how good is that? Oh, they have a whole section on these guys. It's incredible. If you haven't seen that show, go watch it immediately. To understand them, there are two principles we have to understand. Principle one is called levels of organization. Levels of organization is relatively simple. All it says is, as I start to build things up, bigger and bigger things come out of that. So, simple example, I got a cell. What happens when I put a bunch of cells together? What do I get? A tissue. A tissue. What is a tissue made out of? Just a bunch of cells. All I've done is just add a bunch of one thing together and something else, I get something bigger and more complex. Put a bunch of tissues together, what do I get? This little clicker is gonna kill me today. Organ, put a bunch of organs together, what do I get? System, put a bunch of systems together, what do I get? <laughs> put, a bunch of, <laughs> put a bunch of organisms together, what do I get? 
Levels of organization. All I keep doing is adding more of the same thing and eventually something else pops out of that. Cool? Does that make sense? In education and neuroscience, we got a brain. Here's your answer. Here's where everything lives, right here in the brain. Is your brain the final thing? Does everything exist right there? Levels of organization. What happens when I combine a brain with a bunch of other systems? What do I get? I get you. And what happens when I put a bunch of us together? I get a classroom. Levels of organization. I just keep building up, up, up. Cool? Here's where things break. And this is, this is the game changer. This has changed essentially the way we approach science fundamentally and the way we conceive of everything. It's called emergence. Here I got a yellow circle and a red circle, right? Let's imagine that we lived in yellow circle world, that that was our entire world. We did nothing but exist in yellow world. And, and we've spent thousands of years there doing science and we have nailed yellow world. We know everything there is to know about you, every subatomic particle, how it works. We have solved yellow world, science is done, go home, go away. If that's what we got, where in yellow world is orange? Is it in there? So we could have perfect knowledge of yellow world and never have any idea that something called orange exists, right? Let's jump over. We now live in red world. Perfect knowledge, thousands of years of science, we're done. We know everything about red world. Where is orange? Is it in red world? So where is it? Orange emerges when we bring yellow and red world together. It is not a property of yellow world. It is not a property of red world. It emerges when those two worlds come together. Perfect knowledge of the individual parts tells us nothing about what's gonna happen when we bring those parts together. So let's go back, back to our little cell here. So I got myself a cell and we just imagine water's flowing by it and chemicals are floating by it. It's just kind of sitting there having a good time, right? Now put a bunch of cells together and watch what happens. All of a sudden you start to trap water. You start to catch chemicals in the, you, new properties start to emerge. It's still just a cell. Does an individual cell care about the water or those chemicals flooding by it? Put a bunch of them together and new properties emerge. Permeability, malleability. These things aren't in the cell, they're in the group of cells. Put a bunch of tissues together and all of a sudden you can create your own liquids. You can create your own chemicals. You're not stuck anymore. Emergence is the process by which, and I gotta have to go back to my videos now. Emergence, <laughs> Emergence takes us from this guy, who is awesome, that's arguably my favorite clip of all time, into these guys. Oh shit, that didn't work out well. Where'd he go? Oh. Well, all you really need to understand is once you get all of those things together, they can do incredible things. How many people have ever learned or studied ant colonies? The incredible things, you have these incredible organizations of ants that can move around, communicate, build these entire networks. And for the long, there we go, hooray. So here I'll show you what happens when you put a bunch of stupid ants together. Does this, for a long time we thought that that whole thing happened because there was a queen ant, right? There was one major ant telling all other ants what to do. Then we studied the queen ant and guess what the queen ant does? 
Lays eggs. Queen ant does absolutely nothing but lay eggs. It doesn't talk, it doesn't send out signals, it doesn't coordinate, it's not like Game of Thrones where it gets to go, cool, I'm in charge here. This literally emerges from putting millions of these stupid things together. Put a bunch of stupid ants doing stupid loops together and all of a sudden you get behaviors that emerge, that pop out, that simply aren't existent in any of those ants. And we don't really know where it is. So you can kind of see how this has changed the way we approach science, which is typically a reductive thing. We're trying to say, okay, cool. Once we get to the very bottom, we'll solve everything else because everything has to be built up. Emergence says you could know everything about the base and that's not gonna tell you anything about what's gonna happen up here. In our care, in our estimation, here's what we care about. We got the brain. Put the brain in a body and all of a sudden you've got a person. Put a bunch of people together, all of a sudden you've got a school. My question to you is what emerges once you put a brain in a body that simply doesn't exist in the brain? In this instance, the brain is yellow world and the body is orange. What emerges at this level that literally does not exist in here? Sensations. Sensations, absolutely. So that, that takes care of sight, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching. What else? Emotions. Emotions do not exist in here. There is not a neuroscientist on the planet who will talk about emotions because it does not exist there. Emotions emerge once you put a brain in a body. What else emerges? Speaking. Speaking. Listening. Listening. Moving. Moving. I just say behavior, how about it? Everything we care about human beings emerges here, it's not in here. Now let's take it a step up. What emerges once you put a, lot, a bunch of human beings together that simply doesn't exist in any one human being? Lots of behaviors. Lo many behaviors. <laughs> <laughs> Relationships, absolutely. Communication. Communication, ha 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 ha. Absolutely, what's that? Conflict. Conflict, yes sir. I say these integrated social behaviors because there's just so many of them, but this is the idea. These things don't exist in here and they don't exist in here. They exist once this comes together. It emerges from the mixing of those things. What this means is anyone who tries to say, I know this about the brain, therefore here's what you should be doing in your classroom. Does that make sense? Why not? What are they missing? all the things that emerge at the psychological and educational level. Now, people laugh and they go, so this is really, no one's ever done that. Bull, this is what dozens and dozens and dozens of people around Australia right now are trying to do. And here's my favorite one. <laughs> I could pick out any example you want. We know that the brain runs off of a single chemical. What's that chemical? Does anyone know? Glucose, glucose is a? Sugar. So the brain runs on? Sugar. If the brain runs on sugar, then surely we should be feeding students sugar because that will help their brains work better. True? No. UWA spent a million dollars last year on that very thing. What emerges at the psychological level when you give somebody sugar that doesn't exist in the brain? Yeah, <laughs> things get weird. Now what happens, <laughs> what happens when I give a bunch of kids sugar? <laughs> Congratulations, this is not the world you want to be living in. So is it wrong that the brain runs on glucose? Is that, is that somehow a non-fact? It's true, the brain runs on glucose. Does that mean it automatically correlates with anything at higher levels? Why not? Because lots of other things impact on them as well. Emergence. This is, this is the crux of emergence. Just because we understand something about the brain, until we understand that at a psychological and educational level, we really have nothing to say. Because new things emerge and happen that we need to explore and make sense of before we can make any of this stuff meaningful to you guys. So here's all this is meant to say. There is one form, what we try and do is we try and do what's called translation. We know this about the brain, therefore do this in your room. 
anyone from here on out, any neuroscientist, any politician, any chemist, any psychologist, any, I don't, anyone who comes to you and tries to give you a prescriptive thing to do from what we know about the brain, you can tell them, take a walk, because it can't happen. There is zero, zero, zero opportunity for, from here till eternity that something we know about this will directly impact what you do tomorrow in your classroom. It's just never gonna happen because of emergence. So what good is it? So why the hell am I here? Why do we still do this? Well, I do wanna say this before I say that. <laughs> Because how many, I, you guys have seen it, we live in this world. How many people try and tell teachers how to do their jobs? And how many of those people are teachers? <laughs> like let's take, who's my, my favorite, it's a guy, I, he's my boss, so he knows I make fun of him all the time. I think he's totally full of shit, but there you go. How many people have read Visible Learning with John Hattie? Or now know of this guy? This guy is the most important man in education today. He was just voted it a couple months ago. Wow. Guess how many times he's taught in his life? You can count them on zero hands. That man has never run a classroom in his life, yet people are turning to him for the answer of how to teach? Who is the expert teachers in this world? Who knows more about teaching than anyone else in the world? Would you go to a neuroscientist and tell them how to do their job in a wet lab? Would you go to a lawyer and say, next time you're trying a case, I've taught kids, here's how you try that case. <laughs> then why do we accept this from anyone else? From here on out, when it comes to prescriptive translation, when it comes to doing your job, when it comes to how do, what do I do tomorrow? I've got a kid who's acting like a fool, what do I do to help him? I've got this class, I need this struggle, what do I do? Who should you be turning to for help? You are the experts in this world at your job. And at the end of the day, this is one of the, my big pushes over the next 10 years, is I really want to systematize that so that teachers, you guys start to recognize, you guys need each other, and you know your job better than any jabroni like me who stands up here and talks to you. Just because I work in a university and do research doesn't mean I have any clue how to teach. Cool? So from here on out, when it comes to prescriptive, what do I do in my classroom? We need to start building this network because the answers are gonna come from the people who are on the ground day by day by day. So what good is knowing about the brain? If, should I just walk away now, are we done? Here's what it's good for. It's another form of translation called conceptual translation. It doesn't tell you what to do, but it might give you a new lens through which to explore what you're trying in your own room. It might give you a different perspective on something. One of the greatest things whenever we talk about the brain or behavior I've, I've, I can ever hear is when somebody says, oh, is that why my kid does X? That's a new conceptual shift. What you're doing is you're looking at your typical day-to-day -day in a different light. And that's what this is good for. You can get new ideas. It won't tell you what to do with those ideas, but it might help you think differently about your day-to-day. -day. Cool? Does that kind of make sense? So are there any questions about that before we dive in? I just, I, I always like to make this clear off the bat. Do not listen to people like me in terms of how to do your job. Listen to people like me in terms of getting a good idea about things or maybe changing your perception. Cool? Jared, I just want to re really reiterate what you're saying because when, when we finished off our last session, we had the primary teachers sitting here together and talking in a group and we had the secondary teachers out there. Yeah, yeah. And the significance of the conversation coming from people who are only in their first year of teaching and what they were sharing and uh, sharing about what was working, what wasn't working, it's unbelievable. And so that network of teachers supporting each other and learning from each other was incredible just as in the sense is that. And that's where it's going to come from. So you guys are all first year teachers. So who else can you turn to for help? First year teachers. Who else? Second year teachers. Who else? Third year teachers, I love it. There are so many resources around you. <laughs> take what we all take as a conceptual stuff. And if it doesn't resonate with you, it doesn't resonate with you. And that's totally fine. You know your job better than I know your job. Cool? One of these days I'm going to get this clicker to work. But until that day, so how do we start? Here's how I like to start. I like to start with Miss 
Marla Olmsted. Does anyone have any clue who this woman is? And by woman, I mean young, young girl. So Marla Olmsted, she, she grew up, her mother was a, was just, just took care of her and her brother, so she was a, a house mom, and her dad was an abstract painter. So from a very young age, she started painting. And by the time she was two and a half, um, a local coffee shop owner had seen one of her paintings and said, can I just put some of her paintings up on the wall? Yep, somebody bought one, so she sold her first painting at two and a half. She had her first gallery show when she was three and a half, and she sold her first massive painting for $40,000 when she was four years old. She is, or was, she's older now, a child prodigy painter. And when you see her work, it makes perfect sense. I mean, this girl was doing just obscenely good art for, for, for anyone. So here we've got this four-year-old girl just killing the art world. And of course, that rings the ear of somebody else. And some researcher said, you know what? This is a really cool story. There's one problem with this story. Nobody had ever actually seen Marla Olmsted paint. Her dad and mom sold the paintings and said, yep, this is her work, but no one had ever actually seen her paint. So they said, can we just come and film her painting once? And they said, no, no, we can't do it. I'm sorry. She doesn't like, she, she doesn't like to be watched when she's painting. So <laughs> finally, after a year of struggle, they said, okay, you can come in. We'll film it for you. We'll film her painting something so everyone can see that it's genuine. Here's the painting they filmed her making. <laughs> does that look like the same painter? What does it look, who, what age child does it look like painted that? Yeah, four or five year old. So over the next couple months, they started filming her. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up two paintings that were attributed to her. One while she was being filmed, one while she wasn't. See if you can guess which one she was being filmed painting. Hmm. <laughs> Let's try again. Hmm. Let's try another one. Hmm. Why is it so easy to recognize the ones she painted as a kid versus the ones she was supposed to have painted? They're colorful. They're more colorful. They're, sure. They have characteristics of Charles Martin's like. So they've, let's put it simple, it looks like a kid painted it. You just know that a kid painted that one, right? We know somehow we can look at this and we can say there's something about this that's pretty deep, that's meaningful. There's something about this that isn't. It's just colors thrown together and splashed together. It looks cool, I love it, but it's very clearly, here's some dots around a circle, Mickey Mouse is in all of her paintings pretty much. You know a kid did it. What about this guy? That guy paints like a child. But would any of you mistake this for a kid's painting? Why not? How can you look at this and know that, that this is not a kid's painting and look at one of Marla Olmsted's and say, yeah, that's definitely a kid's painting, even though the two are both child-esque in their appearance? of kidism, so there's something behind this. A lot of people don't know this, I have a feeling you do. Picasso <laughs> was a master at age 12. Oh yeah, most people haven't seen that one before. Here's a painting of his mother he did at 15. He mastered expressionism by 22, mastered cubism by 25, synthetic cubism by 33, switched over to neoclassicism by 42, mastered surrealism by 64, and it wasn't until he was 87 that he started to paint like a kid. And he said it himself. It took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. So the point is this. One of these horses was painted, painted by Picasso, and one of these was painted by my niece. <laughs> Can you tell which is which? <laughs> It's not enough to simply know the rules or to know some ideas or to do 
actions or activity. You need to know the rules of a game before you can meaningfully break them. The reason we know a Picasso is a Picasso is because he understood the game. When he thought outside the box, it was because he spent plenty of time learning that box. So when he broke it, he broke it for a reason. When a kid breaks it, it's because they don't know any better. And we are aware of that. There's no purpose to that breakage. So it is all important to know the rules of a game before you can start to break those rules. I mean, how many times do we say, especially to our kids and people to us, you gotta think outside the box. Bullshit. You gotta know the box first. It is impossible to think outside the box until you know the box. And that's where this neuro and psych stuff comes in really good. It teaches us the rule set, the foundation, the framework of how the system works. So that when somebody comes in and says, tomorrow you should do this activity, you know where to layer that. You understand why that activity fits where it does, what it's working on. And once you know the why, then you can start to tweak that activity to fit you. You're not just taking it like a recipe saying, I better do this because somebody else did it. You go, okay, I get why this would work and I wanna tweak it in this way, this way, and this way. That's how you start to think outside the box. So that's what this is all good for. You guys wanna learn the basic rules of the brain real fast? No? Do at least half of us wanna learn the basic rules of the brain right now? Okay, I'll take half. I'll take 50% of you, the rest of you, do whatever you wanna do. Here is, <laughs> here is your lovely hunk of meat. That is a good looking thing, isn't it? What do we know about this right off the bat? Like, what do you guys come in? It's a brain. There's two hemispheres. There's two hemispheres. We've got a, a left and a right. The left hemisphere controls which side of your body? Right. The right. Right hemisphere controls which side? Yeah. Left. Boom. And that's true for everything except for one sense. What's the only sense that doesn't cross? It goes straight back. Sight, Sight crosses. Yeah. Smell. Smell is the only thing that goes straight back. It doesn't cross. And also, well, this is kind of tangent. I just, I like talking about shit. <laughs> Smell is also the only sense that doesn't transduce. So when you see something, a wavelength hits your eye, and what you actually see is the dying of cells at the back of your eye. They, they switch back and forth between white and light, depending on the light. The signal you get is actually that dying action in the back. Same thing with, with hearing. You don't hear the wavelengths. Wavelengths of sound tickle hairs in your ear, and what you hear are those hairs moving. Smell is the only thing that doesn't transduce. When you smell something, it's because physical pieces of that thing actually enter your brain and connect directly to receptors. So when you smell a rose, that rose is literally in you now. I, I like to leave it at the rose, but you can feel free to take it as far as you'd like. But what do we, what's unique about smell compared to the other senses as well? What is it really linked to? Memory. There is something about smell that it is so strongly linked to memory. And we think, no one knows why yet, but we think it has to do with this idea that it never crosses and it's a direct interface with the world. So we think that this is probably the first thing that evolved and that's why it is so strong and strongly tied to memory. So if you ever wanted to play with smell in your classroom, it's awesome. Good smells. <laughs> what, <laughs> what else? So we got hemispheres, we got a big old, big old brain looking thing. What else do we know? Lobes, we got how many lobes in the brain? Four lobes, and they're only on the outside of the brain. You can't really see them. They're not, unfortunately, defined. But you have four lobes on the outside of your brain, and then a bunch of stuff deep in the middle. Absolutely, what else do we know? When we started this endeavor, and this isn't even that long ago, I'm talking, this is probably, 150 years ago, a little, little more than that, we just for a long time just thought that, that this was it, that the brain was just an all-purpose meat machine. Kind of like your stomach, food goes in, it digests, food comes out. Brain does the same thing, information comes in, it processes, information comes out. We just thought it was, it was just one giant unified thinking machine. 
And then this guy came along. So we call that phase one. That's how we started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you up to where we are now so you understand exactly where, how we talk about the brain now. This man then came along. Does anyone notice anything iffy about this dude? What? Something wonky going on with that left eye. He's winking at us. So this is Phineas Gage. Does anyone know the story of Phineas Gage? Do you want to? Do you have a pole through his frontal lobe? He did indeed. So Phineas Gage worked on the railroad. And his whole, he was what was called a blower, a really unfortunate name for a job. He, but his job was anytime you're laying down railroad tracks and you hit a hill, you can either go around it, you can go through it, or you can just blow it up. His job was to just blow it up. So he would go up there, he would, and that's why they called him a blower. He'd dig a hole, fill it with black powder, and then blow up the hill. Now, black powder, if you just, if you've ever lit black powder, has anyone, you've played with a sparkler before, right? So a sparkler is just loose black powder. So what happens when you light a sparkler? Does it explode? It just kind of, and same, do you see the revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio? When he put black powder on his neck and lit it, it's just fizzly. How do you make it explosive? You gotta compact it. Make it tight and then you can make it explosive. How do you make it tight? So glad you asked. You put a giant metal pole on it with a pointed end. Why it needed a pointed end, I don't know. And you hit that with a metal hammer. So that's what he'd do. Dig a hole, fill it with black powder, put this on it, and then just start hitting it with a hammer. What do you think might happen every once in a while when you hit a metal pole with a metal hammer? Oops. So that's what happened with him. He came down, ignited the black powder, the pole shot up, caught him right above the jaw, ripped out through his left eye, took the entire front part of his brain out, popped out the top of his head, and it landed 30 meters behind him. That's how much force this thing came up with. And what do you think happened to Phineas Gage? He picked up his hammer and he kept working. The kid didn't even lose consciousness, just kept going. In hindsight, you, you know, he's probably in shock, but, it's just, it's <laughs> but if, for the most part, we thought, cool, here we go. Here's a dude, he just ripped out half of his brain, and he's still alive and normal. So we were totally right. The, the brain is just a giant meat computer. You can take half of it away. It doesn't matter. It'll still do its job. But then weird things started happening. So before the accident, he was a nice dude. He was married. He had kids. He just worked hard. But after the accident, he didn't, he, just, he didn't really care about his wife anymore. So he just kind of stopped talking with her. And the kids were a bit of a hassle, so he couldn't be screwed. So he just kind of let them go. So his wife and kids left. Didn't really want to get up for work anymore. Just didn't care about work anymore. So lost his job. Dude ended up dying alone and penniless. But he didn't really care. So something, but the people who knew him said that, look, the dude who went into that accident was different than the guy who came out of that accident. Something changed. He went from this normal guy to this kind of just blah, non-caring dude. So losing half of his brain did do something, and that's where we hit phase two. We said, okay, it's called modularity. It's not that the brain is one giant processor. It's that the brain is made up of dozens and dozens and dozens of individual processors. And each of those have their own little jobs. And that's how the brain works. In this case, this dude lost a lot of the processors that let him feel enthusiastic and achieve goals and go to work. So we went from the brain is one thing into the brain is dozens and dozens and dozens of small things. Question then. And this is where we go from here. If we have dozens of small computers, how do they all talk to one another to give us a single perception? Because we don't feel like there's dozens of us walking around. We feel like there's one of us. There's one reality. So the question is, how does all of this then integrate? So I'll show you the first theory. What I'm going to do is I'm going to play you a sound. Well, it's a sound of a woman saying baba. So all you have to do is hear it and see if you can hear her saying that. Cool? She'll make it clear. Here we go. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you hear it, right? Uh -huh. Cool. Now I'm going to play the exact same thing, except I'm going to show her face now while she's doing it. So same clip, just with her face. Here we go. 
What is she saying now? Close your eyes. What is she saying? Open your eyes. What is she saying? We hear tha tha, kind of ga ga, maybe da da. So why is it when we shut up? <laughs> oh, she's mad. She does not like me. Stop. Not in the middle of my demonstration. So wait a second. We know she's saying Baba, but when we look at her, we hear something. What ha what's happening? Why is that happening? What's going on? So because of what we're seeing, she doesn't look like she's saying ba. We literally start to hear something else. So our first theory was, cool, here's how all the computers must integrate. They must just meld together and what we get is an average of all of them. So in this case, you see her saying something like da da, you hear ba ba, and kind of the, the average of that would be kind of ga ga or da da, so that's what we hear. All these senses, the world is out there, information comes in, all of it just mixes together and what we experience is just the average of everything coming in. That theory lasted about three years because it's just kind of nonsense. And I'll show you what broke that. You guys ready for this game? Oh, not again, why? I'm gonna put a color in this square. All you have to do is out loud, tell me the color as fast as you can. Are you ready? Green, blue, purple, green, blue, red, green, purple, red. Sweet. All right, y'all know what's going on. <laughs> Round two. <laughs> no. Oh. no, this is so fun. This is good. This is good. For those of you who had too much wine last night, prepare to enjoy. I'm going to put a word up. All you have to do is read the word as fast as you can. Are you ready? Red, green, red, purple, blue, green, red, blue. Sweet! Y'all know what's going on. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to put a word up there, but each word is going to be written in a different colored font. Your job is to tell me out loud as fast as you can what color is that word written in. I don't care about the word. I don't want to hear that word. I just want to know what color the letters of that word are. Are you ready? As fast as you can out loud. Here we go. Oh, we started out bad. That just came off the gun. I think it, it opened up with red and then it just all went. No one stood a chance after that one. Why was that so, did you feel it? Why was that so hard? What's going on? So give me, so talk, think about modularity. If we have different parts of the brain, what are we getting? Two different messages. So you got one part of your brain that likes what? Colors. It sees colors, what does it do? That's the international symbol for brain going active. It goes, yay! Color, it does its job. Does it care what else is going on in the world? It has one job, colors. When it sees it, it does it. You have another part of your brain that likes what? Words. words. It sees a word, what does it do? <laughs> I wish I wouldn't have done that. Ah. Does it care what else is happening in the world? So we have color area, we have word area. What happens when you try and pit those against one another? Did you feel, you felt that moment where it was like, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, you can feel both of those things happening and you have to select one. Now if that original theory of just mixing was correct, and we had kind of purple and red, we all should, what's kind of the mix between purple and red? Kind of brown? So we all should have just said brown really quickly. But of course that didn't happen. But you were able, as hard as it was, you were able to say red, right? So right now you can say purple, but you can say no. Red. So we can do it. We have these competing things and we can choose one that we want. So that's how we hit the next phase, which is phase four. We call this the controller phase. 
And the idea, now if you had to pick a part of your brain from what, whatever you know where you think the controller lives, where do you think the controller is? Have you heard that the frontal lobe is kind of the human part of the brain, it makes us us? Guess where the controller lives? Hey, there he is. And the controller does one thing. So here we go. So we got our controller. We got one part of the brain that likes colors, one part that likes words. You were able to say the color. So what does the controller do? The controller really only does one thing ever. What does it do to make it so you can say the color? It lets one through. It lets one through. It's the opposite of that. The only thing your frontal lobe controller does is it turns things off. So information, the world is out there, information comes in, it triggers off all of its mini computers. What your controller does is it says, nope, 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 whatever's left, go to town. So here we have the inhibitory network, and this is why a lot of the times you'll hear with kids as they're getting older, executive function, inhibition, decision making, all that is is the ability to shut down programs that are running, because they're all going to run no matter what. And here we thought we'd, break, we'd broken it, we, we're done. And this was relatively recently that we got to this stage and we said, well, cool, congratulations, we just solved the brain. There's a bunch of different nodes, there's a controller, information comes in, triggers off those nodes, a controller shuts half of it down, and whatever's left is us. And that's how the world works. And then this happened. 12 black lines and a little colored box changed everything. So you're looking at this cube, right? So what I want you to do is I want you to make that green face the front of the cube. So it's kind of, it's transparent green, it's the front of the cube, the cube starts here and it kind of goes backwards down and to the right. Now flip it. I want you to turn the green face to the back of the cube. So the cube starts here with this white face and it kind of goes backwards up and to the left. Now flip it again. Now flip it again. How many people can't do it? It's all right, we'll do more. There's more coming up. How many people can do it? So for the people who can do it, is this picture changing at all? Am I, is the wavelengths bouncing off of it, hitting your eyes now, are they any different than they were 10 seconds ago? Is the world changing? Yet you can see two different things. Who's doing that? <laughs> Happened. <laughs> Huh. Let's do another one, just because I love it. This is such a big point. We'll do another. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set up a scenario. We're, we're going to Mardi Gras. It's, 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 we're in New Orleans. It's going to be great. It's a masquerade ball. So I got my mask. Are you guys ready to go to Mardi Gras with me? Sweet. There's my mask. Do you guys see my mask? Cool. Now, while I'm at this party, I meet a lovely young lady. We hit it off. Sparks fly. The night ends in, in magic. What I want you to do is keep looking at this picture, but I want you to focus on just the kind of blurry black and white face bit and see if anything else pops out at you now. Mmm. Oh, I got a few. Oh, got a few. Oh. <laughs> Who still doesn't see it? If you do see it, what is it? Two people kissing. Hmm. Hmm. It's about to kiss. They're in profile. I'll try and outline. So it's a dude's face coming in sideways. I'll cover up the woman. So here's his nose and his mouth and his eyeball. And then he's kissing a woman. Now go back and see the mask. If you can see the two people kissing, go look at the mask again. And if you can see the mask, go back and look at the people kissing again. 
Is this picture changing at all? Is the world and any, the information coming into your brain any way, shape, or form shifting? Yet you can see two different things. Who's doing that? We're going to do one more. We know intellectually that this square is exactly the same color as this square. We all know it, yet I guarantee you nobody in this room sees it that way. All I'm going to do is I'm going to just fade out the picture, except for those two squares, and see if you can feel the exact moment when you decide that square is not orange, it's actually brown. I've been doing this with, a, I've been teaching with a guy for about three years at uni, and for three years he thought I was kidding with this. He thought I was somehow manipulating it, so he finally cut it out himself and blocked it off. He's like, oh God, you've been doing that, that's real. All I'm gonna do is fade it back in again. I promise you it's, I'm not gonna shift it. And I, in, the, in the meantime, the wavelengths bouncing off of that cube, are, they're not going to change. Nothing about the world is about to shift. But see if you can feel the exact moment when you decide, that's not brown. Who's doing that? They enjoyed it. <laughs> I'm doing a simulcast. They're all up in a tree watching this too, going, what? Why do we think that's not brown? Because it's in a shadow. And we have incredible knowledge of how shadows work. When something goes from light to shadow, we know it doesn't actually change in color. So what we do is we mentally shift it ourselves so it stays, so this is like when we watch footy and somebody runs from the light to the dark, we don't suddenly go, hey, who's that new guy? Where'd the other guy go? We know that things move and merge when they go from light to shadow. So guess who does that merging? We do. Now imagine, this is a horrible thought experiment because it doesn't really work, but imagine you had a kid who somehow grew up in a closet and never saw color, never saw light and dark, doesn't understand the difference between shadow and light. If you brought that kid out and said, what, is that the same color as that? Guess what they'd say? Yes. Absolutely, they'd have no problem seeing it. Something we have learned has shifted the way we are seeing this. That brought us into phase five, and this is where we're at now. It turns out our controller isn't just a controller, it's also a coder. So we put it back in the same spot, and instead of just saying we have this thing that turns off automatic programs, what we've learned is we actually have this thing that is actively, at the neuronal level, coding each of those programs minute by minute, second by second. It's actively going in there and shutting down neurons depending on how we think the world should be, so that we perceive it in that way. So go back to her. When you hear Baba, but see something else, why does what we hear change? It's not because everything mixes. Why does it change? So, what ha so we see something, and what do we do then? We send out signals to our auditory cortex to say, here's how I think the world is gonna be. I'm seeing her say the, the, so I think I should be hearing the, the, so what do you literally at the neuronal level hear? The, the. Doesn't matter what the world is actually doing. You physically change your perception so that you hear what you expect to hear, not what is actually out there in the world. Oh, if we had to put this simply, here's how we'd say it. For the first four phases in the longest time of neuro research, we thought it worked like this. The world was out there, information came in and triggered it off. Phase five says what? At every moment, we are actively pushing back. The world is out there, sure. But how we perceive it, how it actually manifests, is impacted by us at every second of every day. None of us get it clean. So what controls what we actually see, what we actually experience? In neuro, we call them schemas. In psych, we call them concepts. The easiest way to understand it is this, is your story. The stories we use to understand the world 
literally dictate how we see, hear, taste, smell, understand the world around us. It's not cute. We can watch this thing happening at the cellular level. And this is where emergence comes in huge, because where are our stories? Nowhere we've ever seen. One day, unfortunately we just don't have time today, we'll look at memory and these ideas. One of the jokes about memory is no, we've never been able to find them, because we don't know where these things sit. They're not in there. It seems to be that they emerge from it and then they feed backwards to physically change the things I created. This is the only time in nature that we've ever seen this type of behavior. Typically, like, let's just take non-organic material and we just put rocks and rocks build up in the mountains, so on and so forth. You never get this feedback. Whatever emerges is cool, but it doesn't influence anything underneath it. This is the first time that when we emerge, when the mind emerges, when stories are created, we see a feedback that physically changes all the chemicals that make up that story so that it reflects and bolsters that story. I want to show you how deep this gets. Cool? William Gladstone. Does anyone know who this guy is? Poor guy. Anyone? No one? Gladstone was prime minister of the UK four times in the late 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I always feel so bad for him because you know the fourth time he, he became Prime Minister, he's like, I'm going down in history. No one is ever going to forget me. hundred years later, I don't have a clue who he is either. I, I just had to look that up. So he was a politician, but his true passion was Homer, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Those two books, as far as he was concerned, that was reality. So he treated those like people treat the Bible. He said, if you want to know how to live, if you want to know truth, if you want to know morality, it's in there. It's in the Odyssey and it's in the Iliad. So he spent his entire life just deconstructing those books, finding what he could find. By the time he died, he'd written 4,000 pages on just those two books and what they meant. So he's going through and he finds something interesting. It all started with a single sentence. Uh, uh, Homer's talking about Achilles going back, getting back in his boat and going, going back... Um, um, to wherever the hell he's from. Sorry, I can't remember. Whatever island. And it says he was going to get in his boat and he was going to cross the wine dark sea. Four words. The wine dark sea. Gladstone had lived by the ocean his entire life and he said, hmm, I see the ocean all the time and I don't know that I've ever seen it a color that I would say is the same as a glass of red wine. It just didn't make sense to me. So he started going through and he, and he realized Homer uses colors in a very weird way. So Homer calls uh, sheep purple. He calls iron violet. He calls honey green. He just really wonky stuff. So Gladstone goes, okay, he goes through and he says, I'm going to count up how many times Homer uses different color words in the Odyssey and the Iliad. And I'm just going to see what I find. And what he got was this. Homer uses the color black 170 times, the color white 100 times, the next most used color is red at 13, green and yellow less than 10 each, and one color never once appears in either the Odyssey or the Iliad. What color just never made it in? Blue. Blue. It just wasn't there. He goes, that is strange. So he goes back and he goes through all ancient Greek literature he can find. So all of Homer's contemporaries. And he counts up color words. He finds the same thing. Ton of black and white, a little bit of red, very little green and yellow. And what color never once appears in any ancient Greek piece of literature? Blue. Blue. Just didn't exist. He said, I think I figured it out. Homer must have been colorblind. And by extension, every single ancient Greek author must also have been colorblind. Everyone said, that's nonsense, thank you. That was a funny theory, move on with your life. So he did, he dropped it, never talked about it again, went about his business, died a happy man. 20 years later, this man comes on the scene, hears about this idea, and he says, I think there's something there. So Lazarus Geiger goes and he looks at the ancient literature of every culture he can find. So he picks, he did Icelandic texts, Egyptians, Japanese, Chinese, Vedic texts, Hebrew. He takes 
every culture, and he goes as far back as he can in the literature, and all he does is count up color words. And he found that every single culture around the world showed the same exact pattern. All cultures start with black and white. The very first color to appear in every single major culture's writing is red. Then green and yellow kind of alternate. And the last color to appear in every piece of writing around the world, with the exception of one culture, is what? Blue. Blue. It just didn't exist in the ancient world. Now, one culture did have blue earlier than the rest. Does anyone want to guess what that culture may have been? Aztecs. Wasn't the Aztecs. Close idea, though. Same. Mayans? Not the Mayans. Um, not, I mean, I was thinking conceptually it's a similar idea. It was, it was, it was actually it was the Egyptians. That was, was it? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Huh. <laughs> what did the Egyptians have that nobody else had? Bingo. <laughs> the Egyptians had a stone called lapis lazuli, which was stark blue. And they could synthesize it, crush it down, synthesize it, and make it into a, uh, a powder. And so he says, okay, wait a second. I got it. Blue isn't very prominent in nature. There's not a lot of blue buffaloes roaming the plains. There's not a lot of blue flowers. Any blue flower we have now is actually genetically engineered to be blue. Blue's just rare. So we said, cool, makes sense. Until you can synthesize blue, you simply don't talk about it. Until you can create something, you don't speak about it, you don't write about it. And we said, oh, that's a cool theory. And he said, but I don't believe that theory. I think it's the other way around. Until you have a concept for something, you literally don't see that thing. That thing doesn't exist. So it's not that the product then drives the word, it's that the word, the concept, drives our experience. And without the word blue, there is no such thing as blue for people. And everyone said, oh, dude, that's a good theory, get out of here. That's nonsense. How would you ever test that? And he said, I have no clue. So he let it go, never talked about it again. Cut to today. How would you ever test it? Like this. There's a tribe in Namibia called the Himba, and we know their language. And guess what word they don't have? So now we can look and see if this is true. So I'm going to play a little game with you. All I'm going to do is put a bunch of colored squares up here. Your job is just raise your hand as soon as you figure out which square is a different color than the rest. Are you ready? Watch the Himba try to do this. The next experiment is prettier than the Himba. In this one, they show the circle green squares, which includes one blue square. So again, 12 colors, and you point towards the one that is different from the other 11 colors. For us, we have separate words for green and blue. But as the Himba have the same word for both, it takes them longer to spot the blue. <laughs> Look at him trying. For us, it's quite clear. Is it that he's not, not even trying? He doesn't care? He doesn't see it. Now, if you want to experience what this feels like, we have about 17 different words that we commonly use for shades of green. The Himba have 36. Green is a really important color for them. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to put colored squares up here. Your job is to raise your hand as soon as you see which colored square is different. Are you ready? We got one. Man, she quit. <laughs> Still with it? Got a couple? There's only one square that's different. Does anyone want to take a guess? What are we thinking? Ba like here-ish? That one? It's not that one. That one? No. That one? Not that one. That one? Not that one. You're in the you're in the wrong ballpark down here. Can you tell us the answer? The, 
first time I saw it, you know what's funny? The first time I saw it, I had to put it through Photoshop because I totally didn't believe it. It's different. Does anyone see it now? What is it? How is it different? What's funny is I've been doing this, so I can see it. It jumps out at me like a madman now. It's got more yellow in it than any of the other squares. It's more yellowish. We still don't see it, right? Watch the himba do this. Okay, now you can see the new 12 squares. One of them again, and you can color which one. He's testing how long it takes them to spot a character which is different from the others. So that one's different than the one I use. This is what they're looking at. For us, it's quite hard to spot the odd one out. Okay, can you point one more time towards the different color? Very good. But for the him it's easy to see the green, which is different. Our concepts drive our experiences, drive our reality. I could imagine at some point some kid telling you a story about how two days ago you said X and you're like, no, I never said that, I said Y. And due to the concepts, I cannot fault either of you for being correct or incorrect. We experience the world according to our concepts, not according to the way the world actually is. But there's one big problem with this theory, with this color theory. And people almost immediately jumped out. What doesn't make sense about this? Say it. What is the bluest thing in the history of the world that we're all under all the time? The sky. Every culture grew up under this thing. Well, bad news. If this theory is correct, guess what? The sky ain't blue. It's only blue because we've chosen for it to be blue. Now how the hell would you ever test that? Well luckily, the guy in the video who was doing that research was just about to have a kid. And as any good researcher does, he decided to run an experiment. So what he did he had a baby girl, he said, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna teach her the colors. She's gonna know blue as a, as a color. She's gonna know, she's gonna be able to point at this and say, that's blue. What I'm gonna make sure she never hears is that the sky is supposed to be blue. Never gonna tell her that the sky is blue. So they had to really heavily control what books she read, so there was never a book where there was a blue sky. There was never, she couldn't watch a lot of the TV shows that talked about blue. <laughs> it seems pretty hellish for a couple of years, but. So he raises this girl, she's about two and a half, and he says, I'm outside in the park with her, and it's a perfectly blue sky day. And I say, now's my time to spring the trap. So he starts playing the color game with her. He says, what color is that? Green, yay! And what color is that over there? Brown, yay! And he said, and then I did it. I said, what color is that? And he pointed up. And this girl who'd been talkative, effusive, bubbly, this really fun girl, just shut up looked at him like he was crazy. And he said, so I asked her again, I said, what color is that? And he said, she just looked at me like I was pointing at nothingness. So he let it go. He said, okay, don't worry about it, don't worry. So he, over the next six months, every time it was a blue sky day, he'd take her out, they'd play the color game, and he'd say, what color is that? Nothing. She turns three, a little after she turns three, they're outside, he does it again, ba 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 ba. what color is that? And she hazards her first guess. And what do you think she said? Green. Not green. White. white. She said the sky was white. And for the next six months, every time he'd ask her, he'd say the sky was white. And then from about three and a half to four, she started to alternate between saying white and blue. And by the time she turned four, she started to consistently say the sky is blue. But by then they'd stopped controlling everything that she could see and hear, so they don't know where the hell the concept could have come in at any time. But the idea then is simple. Guess what color the himba call the sky? They call it gray. Guess what color Homer called the sky? Gray. The sky isn't blue. I have a question. Yeah. So I'm red, green, color one. Yeah, yeah. And so I just cut, and my, both my parents' DNA. 
and I don't remember if the eyeballs being year two and they said it's a female and female is blind. No, because the test I was. Huh. Is that because my parents never taught me that when red, I could never see red on green? Uh, yeah, red on green because. I wish. No, what's funny is you could, that could be a thing, but it's, no. One in 200 women are colorblind, and it's because you actually lack a receptor in the back of your eye. So you physically can't see certain wavelengths. That's not because I choose not to see it. No. But it is possible. <laughs> it is hugely possible that you could train yourself to no longer see the sky as blue. If you somehow can shift that concept, which is so deeply embedded, you could see the sky as Technically, whatever color you effing wanted it to be. So do we see the same thing? That's the question. <laughs> this is the juice. If you learn nothing else from neuroscience for the rest of your life, remember this, that there is a coder and that dependent on our concepts, on our stories, on our schema, on how we, when the, there's a story, it, it's a myth, but it might not be, that the Native Americans, when the, um, the Spanish first came over in their fleet, the Native Americans had never seen big boats, they'd only had canoes, so they didn't see the boats. They saw that the water was rippling, but they couldn't see the boats. So one dude sat there for about three days until he could see the boat, and as soon as he could see it, he went back and taught everyone else there's actually big boats out there. But there's been a myth that they just, they couldn't see the boats at the beginning and everyone just assumed it was cute. Now people are saying that may have actually been a very true thing. Until you have a concept for something, that thing doesn't exist for you. Which raises a lot of questions. How many people saw that movie, what was the movie last year which was all about this? Uh, the alien movie where the aliens talked in circles? Arrival. Arrival, yeah. Did you guys all see Arrival? Go watch it. This is, it. The whole entire movie is based on this concept. And it raises some really cool kind of questions. But I want to say, do we have to, five? Cool, cool. So there's a problem with the coder. <laughs> I've blown your mind quite a bit, but that's okay. <laughs> You'll have lunch to look up at the sky and cry. <laughs> My life is never going to be the same. <laughs> this is what we're trying to deal with. There's a big problem with this. In order to actively code 24-7 and to change our concepts requires a lot of energy. Your brain right now, if you're just sleeping, if you're doing nothing, so that's why I say right now, <laughs> that will take 20 to 25% of all the energy being used in your bodies up here right now. Once you start coding, that shoots up to about 40 to 45%. So if we had this coder that was on 24-7, we would just be sapped. We wouldn't be able to do anything else. So we figured out that the coder isn't always coding. The coder can turn on and off. What the coder does is it switch be switches between actively changing concepts and changing our experiences, and I'm, well, there you go. I gotta charge my battery. And then predicting our experiences. So you have this kind of push and pull between a coder and a predictor between I'm actively changing things and I'm actively guessing what's about to happen. And so long as the world kind of mit matches my prediction just closely, that's what you experience, not the actual world. So right now you're in, I want you to just close your eyes real fast and I want you to think of nothing. Now as you think of nothing, what are you actually hearing? Who here is actually hearing just nothingness? Apparently there are some meditators that can. But for the most of us, what are we hearing when we try and think of nothing? You hear you. <laughs> think of nothing. No, shut up. Think of nothing. Ah, no, gosh. You hear this kind of tick, 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 tick. How many people started thinking about like reliving a moment from the past? or maybe thinking about something from this morning, or thinking about what you wanted to eat for lunch. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> that is your predictor. What your predictor does is your predictor is constantly just going, and it's running scenario after scenario. How many people have had a fight, <laughs> and then for the next like three days you just run that fight again and again, you're like, should have said that, oh, should have said that. 
What your predictor is doing is it's trying to say, okay, if I have to actively change my story every time I learn something new, it's gonna to be too exhausting. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just gonna run simulations all day, every day, all day, every day. So when you experience something, I can say, you've already seen that before, don't worry, don't pay attention. You've already experienced this before, don't pay attention, I already have a program, go. It kicks us into an automatic habitual mode. A lot of us think that's a bad thing, but when we come back from lunch, I'll show you that that's actually a really good thing to have. And that we, the prediction, the habit is actually a very useful thing. But it becomes important when we think about how we teach kids, how we play between those two. Between coding and predicting. Coding and predicting. Cool, cool? Sweet, so I am happy, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> the experts in your field and recognizing that and do not, over the course of your career, you're gonna have a ton of people like me coming to talk to you. Tell us to go blow for trying to tell you how to do your job. You know what you're doing. From there, we took a look at then what good is it? We took a look at this idea of concepts of rather than practical advice because of emergence, the only thing you can really take from lower levels is concepts, our ideas, our new ways to think about what you've already seen and what you're already doing every day. We then pushed into how the brain works, built it all the way up to the coder. And where we've left it was, well, then we looked at how the coder creates concepts. Something creates concepts, which then backtracks, and that's how we see the world. But we left by saying the coder can't always be coding, right? Because that's just too dang exhausting. So we switch between a coder and a predictor. What we call this is bottom-up versus top-down processing. Bottom-up processing I forgot that I have a slide there, is when you're in predicting mode. This is when the predictor is running its thing. So when I say the grass is always, congratulations, you guys had that finished before I was close to being done with it. Because your predictor said, been there, done that, got it, move on. So for the most part, you're in bottom up mode. And this means you're living about a second to two seconds in the future at all times. And so long as the world matches, you just live in this mode. Top down is when you flip over to coder. Now you're actively going to be activating and coding things. So a good way to understand this, bottom up. I put this in front of you. Does everyone know what to do? Could you do this while reading a book? Because it's so easy. We have this on such lockdown, it's just habit. So we call this bottom up, and the idea is simple. Information comes in from outside, the world tells us here's what it is, we have an automatic program, we go, yep, I don't even have to cognitively interact with that. I'm good, go. So this is automatic response. Now imagine I sat down, we all sat down at a table and I popped this in front of you. <laughs> Twilight Struggle. Has anyone ever played this game? <laughs> I looked up weirdest board games on Google and this one came up first, so there you go. Twilight Struggle. No one has any clue what they're doing, right? So would we be able to just automatically bottom up this. I have an automatic program play. What would we have to do? You have to read the instructions, practice, think. We have to connect with this, which means we're now in top-down mode. We have to write a program to address this. We say, I don't know what in the hell this is, so I've got to somehow come up with a sequence, something to make sense of this. Now let's say for the next six days we sit there and we play this 10 hours a day, for six days, what is this gonna to start to look like? Bingo. The more you practice at something, the more you can habituate it and then you can flip it into a bottom up. So it's this interplay between having these automatic programs and then having to recode new programs to address things that you weren't expecting. So a lot of people at this point assume that we want our kids in top down mode all the time. That bottom up mode is bad. I assure you, Bottom-up mode is the only way we survive in this world. I want you to give this a read. Read what's in that triangle there. How many of you missed it? I did until you see it. <laughs> How many still don't see it? What's wrong? There's two thes. Why didn't you see the second one? Because surprise, surprise, we don't read anymore. 
We have an automatic program for reading, which means we don't actually have to connect with it. So long as the world matches our prediction, and our prediction says there should only be one the, guess what we see? The. the prediction. I want you to count the number of letter Fs that are in this sentence. How many letter Fs are there in that sentence? All right, raise your hand if you got at least two. And three, four, five, six. There are six letter Fs in that sentence. Count again. What did you miss? Oves, why'd you miss them? So long as the world modicumly matches your prediction, guess what you experience? Now, I'll go back to this one. Let's say you're a kid and you're just learning the alphabet. You don't know how to read. And I ask you how many Fs are in that sentence. Guess how many they're going to say? Six. Six. We didn't see it. Why? Have you guys ever heard of, and I'm sure you have, chunking? God, I hate that, but I love it at the same time. It took me about six years to figure out what that really meant. And a lot of people, and I won't, I won't go too deep into it, because I, I do hours on it if we wanted to, but a lot of people think it's this really cute thing that you teach kids how to chunk. Hey, here's a string of letters, you can chunk them into smaller letters. Who the hell's ever taught a class where all we do is give kids letters, strings of letters and numbers? So it's always seemed like this game, but truth is, the reason you miss those Fs, the reasons you can read this, the reasons you miss that first the is because of chunking. As you get a concept, as you get a new concept, that becomes a new chunk under which you can fit a bunch of information. So when you first start learning letters, you have to learn letters. Once you know letters, you start reading words and you no longer look at letters. Once you know words, you start reading sentences and guess what you stop looking at? Words. words. Once you know sentences, you start reading paragraphs and guess what you stop paying attention to? Once you know paragraphs, you start reading chapters. Guess what you stop paying attention to? Once you learn how to read a full book and you get a sense of a story, guess what you stop paying attention to? This is why every movie and book and TV show you've ever seen is essentially the same story again and again and again. Because we don't actually have to pay attention to it. Finding Nemo is exactly the same thing as The Grapes of Wrath, is exactly the same thing as Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, is exactly the same thing as Walking Dead, is exactly the same thing as East of Eden. It's the same story again and again and again because we know how to read that story now. And so long as we can predict it, all we have to do is chime in and say, hey, it's a turtle instead of a homeless guy, or a zombie instead of a seagull. That's cute. <laughs> Chunking isn't just a cute thing, it is how we live, because it's how we process the world. It's our concepts. And if you really want to blow somebody's mind, all you have to do is break their concept. Well, here we go. I'll show you why. Two ways to change somebody's story, to kick them into top-down mode. So for the most time we're in bottom-up mode, how can I kick you into top-down mode? Here's one way. I was like going down the hill and like this guy like cut me off and like there's a crowd and like and I was like, look, stuff either happens or it doesn't happen. Stuff doesn't sort of like happen. Guess what you just flipped into? Oh my. When your prediction screws up, guess what you automatically have to kick into? Top-down mode. If you're in bottom-up and your prediction fails miserably, you have to go into top-down mode. It's the only way to survive. This is why how many people have heard that errors and mistakes are so important for our kids to make? This is why. Errors are the thing that alert us to the fact that our program isn't right. I'm not going to, oh God, if I had hours with you, oh, there's so much I want to give you. Some students will learn to avoid mistakes and error. Everyone will sense it, but some of them will learn to see that feeling as something to avoid, and they will stick with only that which they're good at. I don't make mistakes here, I'm living here. I make mistakes here, I'm avoiding that. I don't want to fix it. Other students will learn to embrace that and seek those things out. 
If I'm doing well, there's nothing for me to change. It's when I screw up that something good happens. So think about when you learned how to drive a car. How hard was that? How many people here drive? Remember learning to drive? Was that a bitch? <laughs> Hardest thing, man, you've paying attention to 18 things. How many people drove here today? Did we look a little more like that? <laughs> when you first learn something, you have to top down it. Once you get good at it, you can bottom up it. It becomes a program. If you want to shake somebody's foundation, throw a deer in the road. And love it or hate it, you're back in top down mode. You have to change your program. This is why The Walking Dead worked so well. I'm not The Walking Dead, Game of Thrones. That's why Game of Thrones worked so well. Has there anyone not seen season one of, of Game of Thrones? Are you planning on watching it? Okay. All I'm gonna say for those of us who have seen it, they did a perfect thing where they take you along a story that we've all understood. Everyone knows this story, so we're just sleeping our way through it until about episode nine, and then they do something you don't do. We had to top down. Everyone goes, what? You can't do that. And now everyone is hooked because we don't understand how this story is going to work. We no longer have a chunk for it. There's no concept for us to live in. So we watch every week because we don't get it. I love that damn show. If you haven't seen it, go watch the first season. If you get to the end, something will happen and you'll go, wait. You can't do that. Yet they did. So failed. If your prediction fails, you have to go into top down. Counter to that, you can think. If you recognize this, these concepts, these ideas, you can think your way through it. Guess what else we call this? Ding. Easiest way to get into top down and change your programming is to learn, to actively learn new things. You can access and change your own concepts. I'm gonna take a very long, quick tangent here. Ah, oh, shoot, I never get anything done, oh well. All right, so this is a tangent with bottom up and top down. First thing I wanna look at real quick is basic learning when it comes to the brain. If all we're talking about is the brain, there's only one way that anyone learns. Does anyone know the rule of learning in the brain? It's like a quick, quippy little cute saying that people use. It has to do with neurons. Bing! Neurons that fire together, wire together. The only way the brain learns is through repetition, 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 repetition. This is not 100% true. It's actually neurons that fire together frequently wire together, but don't fret one way or the other. The idea is simple. If you don't do things repeatedly, there's just no chance for it to be learned. And yes, I realized recently that that does not say repetition. Correct. See, my own, I missed that for years. I've been looking at that picture and somebody finally like, do you see that says repetitin? Like, <laughs> I did not. <laughs> oh, I got another funny, I'll tell you. But so this is why if you've ever heard that idea that, cool, I just picked up golf, so if I start playing golf, believe me, I sucked. And I still suck, fine. But I'm getting competent. I'm reaching my 1,000 hour mark, ah, I'm decent. But if I get up to 5,000, I'll be a master, 10,000, I'll be a virtuoso. You guys have heard kind of that idea. The more you practice something, the better it's gonna be. It's not 100% true, but for our purposes, the repetition is what counts. Have you guys ever seen this woman? Barbara Aerosmith Young? Or know of her? So she is, one of the favorite people in special education now and one of the most hated people in research because she is absolutely, well, you'll see what I mean in a second. So according to her story, she couldn't learn. She couldn't see things, she couldn't sense relationships, she just couldn't learn. Magically, even though she couldn't learn, she could get a bachelor's of science, but still she couldn't learn. So finally she decided she was going to teach herself how to learn. Of course, she is just a nightmare, this woman. So what she did, <laughs> she sat down with a clock and she put a hand on a clock and all she would do is move the hand and then write down the time. Move the hand, write down the time. Move the hand, write down the time. And what she was trying to do is teach herself relationships. When she got good at one hand, she put on two hands, wrote it down. Move them, turn it down. Put on three hands, four hands, five hands. 10 hours a day, seven days a week for four months. For 2,000 hours, she did nothing but tell time on a clock. And that broke through. Once she had this, she broke through and all of a sudden she could learn. So this is that idea of repetition. The more you do something, that's how you learn it. There's an issue we have to talk about and it's called transfer. 
And this is just a real shallow coloring over transfer, but have you guys heard of transfer? So if somebody says transfer, what do you think we're talking about in education anyway? Bingo. So I take something I know from one context and I can apply it to another context. So there's two flavors of transfer. You have what's the first one is called near transfer. Near transfer says this, if I'm really good at an iPhone 5, what else am I probably going to be really good at? Bingo. If I'm good at one thing, I'm going to be really good at all things that are very similar to that thing. So the converse and the one we're more interested in is this, far transfer. If near transfer means I'm good at one thing and all, what do you think far transfer then means? If I'm good at this, where do I apply it? Somewhere way over here, absolutely. So in this case, and it's hard to find examples of it, but let's say I'm a poker player and I'm really good at that so I can calculate odds quickly and I'm risky and I smoke my cigarettes. I might be really good on a stock market where I have to then calculate odds quickly and take risks, things like that. To understand transfer, all we need to know is this little kid here, baby Albert. <laughs> Have you guys seen little Albert? Yeah. Aww. What did they do to this kid? P.S. We found that we solved the mystery of him. I'll tell you in a second. But what did they do? Does anyone, anyone want to share what they did to this dude? I conditioned him to be scared of anything that was white and fluffy. Bingo. So here he is playing with a rat. This is a drawing, but here he is. He's having a good time. Not scared of the rat. <laughs> what they do is they then showed him the rat and then slammed a big pair of symbols behind his head to startle the hell out of him. So all of a sudden he was no longer happy with this rat. He made that rat bad. But what also happened was he started to hate anything that was even remotely close to it. He started to hate bunnies and stuff too. So here we have little baby Albert and he learned something. He learns that that rat, this thing, is correlated with this really scary thing. So what does he do the first time he learns it? He applies that thing everywhere. He says, not only am I gonna be afraid of this little mouse, I'm gonna be afraid of anything that's hairy, anything that's white, anything that's an animal, anything with four legs. I'm scared. Now what they do is they keep doing it. They show him the mouse and they hit the symbols, scare the crap out of him. Show him the mouse, hit the symbol, scare the crap out of him. What do you think happens after about 10 times of scaring him with that mouse? What does he become afraid of? The mouse. He no longer is afraid of the bunny. He's learned to assimilate, to say, okay, wait a second, that initial fear, that initial thing I learned is really just there. It's not broadly applied. When I first learn something, it's applied everywhere. When I get better at that thing, I start to narrow it in, I hone it down. So let's go to this guy. Okay. I'm Tiger Woods. I'm sitting here and I do this hours a day, years and years and years and years and years of my life. If we think of either bottom up or top down, what kind of training am I doing? What am I shooting for by doing this time and time again? Bottom up. I want this to be automatic. I want it so that when I step out on that golf course, sun hits my eyes, wind in my face, club in my hands, I have an, I'm, I'm over here because I don't care. Boom, automatic program. What kind of transfer do you think when you train bottom up? What kind of transfer do you think you get when you train in a bottom up fashion? And think of little Albert. This is one of the best athletes in the world if you put a golf club in his hand. Horrible athlete if you put a baseball in his hands. That's not how you throw a baseball. This guy has spent years perfecting this, switched the sport and it's gone. The more you drill something, the more you bottom up it, the more narrow it becomes. So back to Miss Aerosmith Young. When you train for 2,000 hours on a clock, what kind of transfer do you think you're gonna get? Near transfer. <laughs> so they have schools that are doing this. Kids do thousands of hours of clockwork with the hope that someday they'll learn to read and do math. What are they gonna get really good at? Clockwork, they're so good. I spent an hour in a classroom, I shit you not. There were 12 kids on a computer doing, a thing would come up, they go tap, tap, enter, 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 at this pace for 60 minutes straight. It was the most miserable classroom I've ever been in in my life. But guess what the kids were really strong at? 
Tap, tap, enter. Tap, tap, enter. Put a book in their hands and guess what they still couldn't do? Because things don't transfer like that. Now, if you want far transfer, what do you have to do? Think to baby Albert. How do you get far transfer? Imagine here's a little kid who's never played a game before, let alone chess. He's just never played a game before. So I sit him down. I say, here's a chess board. You're going to learn how to play a game. Does he have any clue what's going on? So what mode is he in? Bottom up or top down? Top down. What kind of transfer do you think you can expect when you're in top down mode? Ha ha ha. Scare baby Albert. Teach him something new. He doesn't understand exactly how that fits into his schema. So he applies it everywhere. Until he learns it again and again and again, it stays open. But once he learns it multiple times, then he can narrow it down to say, I'm only scared of this rat. Teach a kid something new, top down it, and what you see are these momentary bursts of far transfer, because they're not sure how to apply it. Is it only here that I use this, or is it everywhere? And they start to apply it everywhere. But the more they practice, then the more they can hone it down and say, nope, this belongs here. Does anyone do this? Or let me ask, does anyone know of these things, this kind of concept of brain training? Does anyone have a school where they do brain training? Good. <laughs> this is good. So let me, brain training, all the research is in. It's done. We don't have to even talk about it anymore. Brain training really works well with everyone for about 48 to 72 hours. After that, it doesn't do a thing. Why? When you start it, where are you? If I sit you down at a brain training program and you see a lily pad and a frog and a number and a beep, do you have any clue what's going on? So what, it, it kind of opens this hologram and you're like, I got to learn this stuff. And when you're in that mode, we see you learning and rethinking about other things. How do I assimilate this over here? How do I assimilate over here? After two to three days, guess what you start to get really good at? The brain training game. And it all comes down to one study. This entire field was based on this. So here's the... This will really s nail this home. So this dude is doing research. What he did is he brought people into his room and he said, I'm going to improve your memory. I'm going to see if I can improve your memory. I'm going to read you a list of numbers. You have to just say them back to me. So let's practice it. So 671. Six, cool. 8924. 8924. 7236. Seven, two, three, cool. Every time you get it right, I'm just going to tack another number on. We're just going to keep building. We're going to keep building. <laughs> One hour a day for up to 50 days he did this with these guys. And watch what happened. Blue dude, by day 40, so these guys all quit. They're like, this is the most boring study ever. I'm out. <laughs> but blue dude, by day 40, was able to listen to 80 numbers and spit them right back. 80 numbers, get them easy. And so this is what brain training is based on. And this is what all the, rep, the big stuff, they say, cool, look, you can get smarter. You can get smarter. That wasn't the point of this research at all. The point was the very last thing he did, which no one ever talks about anymore. On the very last day, after they, when they were about to leave, he said, can I do one more thing with you? Instead of numbers, let's do the same thing, but with letters. How do you think they did? Repetition gives you near transfer. It doesn't automatically apply. Just because you can remember numbers, change one small thing, and that doesn't mean you're going to be automatically good at, at that next thing. Sorry, brain training. And I told you, it does work for a bit, and it's because of that novelty. But so this is the idea. Most people now go, well, cool, I want, I get, we're back into that argument of I want my kids to be in top down then all the time, right? Why is that a bad thing? It's exhausting, A, but if you keep a kid here, what do they never actually do? They never actually learn. They just sit in this kind of muck where they're trying to change everything all at once. You need repetition. You need, eventually, things to be locked down. This leads to this. You need bottom-up things and upon which you can build later things. So this is what we call the zone of proximal development. This is why this, there's an entire field of this. And the entire argument is simple. I want my kids to be fluctuating from here to here. I want to shock my kids, open their system, and as they get better, then I want them to drill and I want them to get really good at it. But as they get really good at it, I want to change the rules so they have to go back up. 
And then once they get a little confused, I want to give them practice so they can start to assimilate that. But once they get too bored with it, I want to bring them back up. The idea is I'm just jumping between bottom up and top down, playing this beautiful little game where I'm keeping you new, but now I'm drilling it down so you can use that later. So you have an automatic bottom up program. So th that's how I think about things like math, where first time you learn multiplication and the times tables, it's so weird and you start to think weirdly. But eventually you want that locked down so then when I can change the rule set and say, hey, there's not only multiplication, there's also division. Good news, you already have this on lockdown. So it's not just a matter of I want my kid in top down, it's a play between the two. Yep, yep. So, so, so learning happens, so we put things into autopilot, then we change the rules, so they have to adapt what they know in autopilot to then learn for real learning to take place. Yep, yep, so practice, the learning comes with the practice, and then the change or the growth in conceptualization changes with the, when you change the rule set. And it has to be a change in the rule set. Games are the best at this. So let's say we're playing Twilight Struggle. We suck at it, but then we get really good at it. What do games do that are so awesome to make it so you can never get too good? They keep adding layers of complexity. Bingo. Games will add an expansion pack, or they'll have a part two, and all of a sudden that good guy is now not as strong as he was before. They'll make it so you have to change your strategy. They'll say that strategy that you used to use doesn't work anymore because we've changed the rules. Time to get a new strategy. So kids are always, the video games are so good at just, anytime you get too good with one strategy, they'll make that strategy obsolete. So you have to do something else with it. Does that kind of make sense? All of that, that was my mini, oh geez. That was a mini tangent, but does that kind of bottom up versus top down processing make sense? You have your habitual programs and then you have your actual thinking. And our goal is not to have one or the other, it's to try and swing between both. Shift it when we know it's time to shift it by changing the rule set. All right, what I'm gonna do, I gotta open my next one. Are there any questions on that while I open my next? Or any thoughts? Jared, I wonder, can we do what we did just before? Yeah, that's, have a buzz. that's a great idea. I hear one or two things from people. Buzz, same way we were before, buzz, and then we'll call on two people to respond. Cool, cool. About kind of the industrial model, I think what we talk about is the repetition, is a lot of schools became huge repetition, which is fine, people learn, but I think what we did was swing the pendulum so far the other way, that now we're like, we just want all creativity all the time, all new. It's like, mmm, that's just as bad. If what you want is well-rounded, well-intentioned, intelligent children, you need to flip-flop. You need to kind of sit right here. And it's not easy. And the best way to do it is gonna come from you guys. You guys are gonna know this stuff, not researchers in a lab. You're gonna know where it, look, where it works, how it looks. And I love Hattie, John's a good guy. He's a very smart guy. I love it. Can I say something about that? <laughs> do you guys mind if I take a quick aside? I feel this. No, no, he knows I say this. He agrees with this. Much like everything else, everything has been taken so literally. So we didn't get to do it. If you, if you, damn it, if you guys could have come and learned with me at uni, taken teaching class with me, the first thing we do for an entire semester is we just work on our philosophy. What is the reason we teach? Why are we here? What is our purpose for being in the classroom? Because as you answer that question, that dictates everything you do over here. People don't ask that question enough, so somebody like Hattie comes along and says, here's what you do, and schools go, cool. Here's the top 10 learning strategies, let's do those. John's philosophy with that book is academic outcomes. The only thing that's meaningful about school is academic outcomes, which is awesome. So here are the tech techniques we know that can lead to better academic outcomes. If you're like me, I don't care what grade my kids get. I really couldn't care less about their academic outcomes. I'm much more interested in free thinking and well-being. If I got a kid who's cutting herself, I really couldn't care less if she passes my test. I want her to feel comfortable, in which case visible thinking is meaningless. So it's what is your philosophy? And I think what he's trying to fight now is, is this recognition that, cool, this is a very narrow philosophy that I'm using here. School should be more than just passing tests. And so that's kind of the, so I love, it's good stuff for a very specific purpose, if you know what purpose you're going for. Anyway, love that guy. 
<laughs> Remember when I said the point of this, I just, wanted, I just wanted you to feel this before we move to the last bit here. So prediction, error is the thing that kicks you into top down whether you want to or not. Tells you that something is going on. So I want to show you, I want you to feel what this feels like. Okay, we're going to make an error together. Are you ready? Question, pop quiz. During a bold recording, what spin should the neutrinos have in order to generate a radio signal? Somebody give me a guess. 3.8. 3 is incorrect. You made a mistake. Anyone else? Anti-clockwise, you made a mistake. Who's next? Mistake. Next. Mistake. So we're all making mistakes now, right? Do we care? Why? Because we don't have an ebbing clue. A mistake is only a meaningful mistake when it's predicated on a prediction. We don't have any, this is, we can make mistakes left and right, but it doesn't matter because we don't have a bottom up prediction for this. So it's not cute, it's not fun, it doesn't tell us anything. So now let's get into a mode of something that we know, just so we can, okay, now we're going from unknown. P.S. The answer is anti-clockwise. You are correct. I just had to make an example of you. <laughs> so let's just get into something we know. Here's an easier question. Okay. How many senses does the typical human being have? Oh. 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 Traditionally, if we remove ESP, what are the traditional senses? What are they? Sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, smell. You right? Cool. So this, now we're in a world that we know. All right. What if I told you that that's totally incorrect? That human beings have way more than five senses. Depending on who you ask, we have between 17 and 28 different senses. What? Do you feel that now? That little tickle? That little question that maybe it's disbelief. Maybe it's like, what are you blathering about? No way. When you make a mistake on something you know, that's when you get that moment. So mistakes aren't mistakes unless it's a mistake on something meaningful that something doesn't ex somebody doesn't expect to make that mistake on. If you give me a calculus quiz and I get an F, I'm gonna, uh, those are all mistakes. I don't know jack about calculus and I'm not gonna take that quiz and then learn from it because I, it's all mistakes. I just live in, I don't know what I'm talking about. But if you gave me a neuroscience quiz and I missed two of those questions, guess where I'm gonna be? I need to pay attention. And that's when you get the students. Some of the students will make those mistakes and they'll go, I don't want to be here anymore. And they'll walk away from them. And some will get, make those mistakes and say, that's where I want to live. And it's our job to try and push them over into that process orientation. <sighs> no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're gonna go here. We're gonna go here. <laughs> All right, last thing I wanna do, we're, we're not even gonna get close with this, so don't fret. I was gonna erase that board, but there's no race there. It, uh, it's totally fine, I'm not gonna use it. It's totally fine, I'm, I'm in my head now. Let's take a look at the, at the learning trajectory. So we've got this conceptualization of how the brain works, and we now have this kind of top-down, bottom-up idea. Now let's take a look at how human beings typically learn. What's the process we go through in order to learn something? So this isn't, this can be tweaked depending on different things, but this is gonna be the most primary basic foundation of learning. And it's gonna change, depending, if you have special needs kids, it'll change, if you're doing sports, it changes a little bit, but most basic thing. Here's the big secret of learning. We tend to think human beings are like a calculator. On one side we have processes, and on the other side, we have information. Calculator doesn't care. It has multiplication, addition, subtraction, division. Here's its process. You can plug in any information you want to, and it's gonna be able to run its processes. So the two are separate. You have information and you have process. And so long as you have the process down pat, whatever I give you, you're gonna be able to calculate and punch out. Is this how human beings think? In human beings, there is no such thing as a process without information. You can't do it. Nobody has a skill that is devoid of information. We do not have multiplication, addition, subtraction, division over here. 
depending on the information we plug in, that's gonna depend on what we can and cannot use over here. So we have to stop thinking about this idea of I wanna just teach my kids broad skills because you cannot teach them broad skills without teaching them information. This one pisses a lot of people off, but if you wanna learn something, you always, 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 always have to start right there with facts. And this is the thing, a lot of these 21st century skills and big thinking, they're trying to be like, we just want kids thinking, you can't. There is no such thing as big thinking without facts. If you have nothing to think about, you can't do any thinking. I'll demonstrate this to you, okay? Now this works so much better if I had a reading that I can give you, but I can't. But, so you guys know of listening comprehension, right? We all have decent listening comprehension. Can you hear the words I'm saying? Have you been following me today? So we would say we have good listening comprehension. Cool. All I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a passage. I'm gonna tell you something and just listen and comprehend. Are you ready? So it was the ALS finals last year, bottom of the ninth, Pirates were down by one, but we had a guy on second, which is pretty damn awesome. Now, designated hitter comes in, line drive to left, bounces off the glove of the right fielder over the fence, should have been a home run, game over. Um calls it a ground rule double, which is good because we got one run in and we now got the winning run on second, but the freaking pitcher's coming up next, so guaranteed out coming up there. How many people have no effing clue what I'm talking about? <laughs> But wait a second, I thought you said you had good listening comprehension. Why couldn't you comprehend that? Because you don't have the facts to back it up. There is no such thing as a skill without facts first. You can't just plug in any number and hit multiplication. I was talking about baseball. That was a totally made up story. The Pirates have not made the ALS series in years, but there you go. But, <laughs> Here's why it kind of doesn't work with listening comprehension. The idea is pretty simple. Without the right vocabulary, you're gonna have no clue what I'm saying. You can be the best listening comprehender in the world. But if I'm talking in Japanese, bad news, you ain't gonna get it. And gaps, the world lives in gaps. If a two-year-old asks me what I'm doing on a computer, I'm gonna say, oh, this is a machine where I type words in so I can write a book. If you ask me what I'm doing on the computer while I'm typing, I'm gonna say, what the hell do you think I'm doing? I'm not gonna tell you the answer, but you're gonna know how to cover over all the gaps because we have a common knowledge. You understand what computers are for, so I don't have to say it. Facts build how we understand the world and we cannot apply any process just haphazardly. We need the facts in order to apply the process. Facts always precede skills, always, always, always. So any school or any time you're just thinking, you know what, I don't need you to memorize these facts, you kind of do. Or at least you need to understand them if you want to keep playing in that realm. So I'll just show you, just so we did research on this. You give the kids a baseball package, a passage, and you get exactly what you, you think you'd get. These blue guys represent strong reading comprehenders, orange guys are weak reading comprehension, and you get exactly what you'd think to get. So if this was a standardized test, you'd go, cool. I got my strong readers and my weak readers. Now let's take those groups and further divide them into kids that know about baseball and kids that don't know about baseball and watch what happens. All of a sudden those kids who had low reading comprehension are scoring 25 as opposed to 15. And those kids who magically had good comprehension are actually scoring pretty damn low. So the kids who shouldn't be able to read are out reading the kids who should purely because they know about the topic of baseball. So how many tests, standardized things are we giving <laughs> where we think we're testing some skill in the kid and all we're really testing is do you know this stuff? Hmm. So to understand how this now starts to build up, we have to take a quick look at memory. So in the brain, if you ever hear the word hippocampus, there's only one word you should think of. There's your memory center. I won't get to go too deep into it, but I'll, show, tell, you, I'll tell you a quick story. Oh, first of all, um, hippocampus means seahorse. So if you took out the hippocampus, looks like a seahorse, nobody? <laughs> we, know, <laughs> we know about the hippocampus from this man. This is HM. So HM suffered from uh, intractable seizures. So has anyone here ever had a seizure or has a student or a family member who had a seizure? So what happens during a seizure? 
How so, do they lose consciousness? Yes. yes, they do. <laughs> During a seizure, every neuron in your brain starts firing simultaneously. So what you get is you get these people who lose full consciousness and they get really tight. And then as their system starts to come back on, you'll kind of see this rhythmic jerking as everything's kind of booting back up. So it's not like the movies where they just go, ah, put a belt in his mouth. It's this really systematic thing. When you have it, you're done, you're out. He started having, at his height, he was having 19 of those a day. So he was, as, as you can imagine, he's stuck in a hospital. The guy can't get out. And when you try and pump him full of pills and nothing happens, there was no way to treat it. So his life was in the hospital. So we have a patient like this, I work at St. V's, having 100 seizures a day. So it's actually not that kid that was on the news recently, it was somebody else. They just have no life. So one option we have is to go in there and cut out where the seizure starts. Every seizure will start somewhere. So for him, we knew it was starting in his left hippocampus. So we said, okay, cool. Why don't we go in there and cut out his hippocampus? So we did. We went in there, we cut out both sides of his hippocampus, and the good news is he lived to 86 years old, never had another seizure again. Guess what else he never did again? Never, never made another new memory. He'd work with the same doctors every day for 30, 40 years. Every time he met him, he introduced himself as it was the first time he met him. They kept the same three magazines in his hospital room for 20 years, and he read them every day. Never remember that he read them. What about before that? Did he have memories So he remembered everything up until the surgery, and nothing after that. So in his, he had the surgery when he was 20, 26, 20, 26 was when he had the surgery. So as far as he was concerned, he was 26 years old for the rest of his life, which is what I kind of think I am, too. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. When he, hit, when he hit about 50, they had to take away all reflective surfaces in his room because if he looked in a mirror, he, couldn't, he could not reconcile the fact that, that his mental image of himself as a 26-year-old and then this dude looking back at him. He hated looking at his hands, but he was always a, a, give him 30 seconds and he'd forget any uncomfort, discomfort. <laughs> If you're, if you're interested, I, I find these things fascinating. There's a documentary called Prisoner of Consciousness. So we know of a, uh, there's about eight people. We've never done this surgery again. This guy essentially gave his life so we could learn this lesson, and it sucks. But we will never take out anyone's. We take out parts of hippocampus if we have to, but we will never take out full resection ever again. Um, but a herpes virus attacks the hippocampus. There's one of those, it's a simplex A can attack the hippocampus. So we know of about eight people now who have lost their hippocampus. One of them is in that documentary. It is so hard to watch, but it will give you such a good sense of how important memory is, because this guy is in about a 30 second loop and he'll just say the same things again and again and again, and he just has no clue he's doing it. And it's heart wrenching. So the story is really about his wife. There's a scene where his wife goes home from visiting him at the hospital. And she looks in the camera and she goes, are you ready? And she hits play on her answering machine and it goes like, first message, one o'clock. Hey, this is me over at the hospital. Can you help me? I don't know what's going on. Somebody needs to tell me what's going on. Beep. New message, 103. Hey, this is your husband. I'm over at the hospital. Please, somebody needs to come tell me what's going on. There's just about 18 messages. Every couple minutes, he'll call her back and just leave another message. That's exactly the same as the last one. He has no clue. He just can't. He's stuck in this little loop. Um, but to put a good spin on it, the best athlete in the world, arguably, also has this disorder. Her name is Diane Van Deeren. She's won best international athlete three times in a year from ESPN. She's an ultra marathon runner. She runs 100 mile marathons because she doesn't know she's doing it. <laughs> she, has no, she gets into a rhythm of running and she doesn't know if she's hungry, tired, sore, or anything, and she'll just run. And she destroys everyone else. She ran a race in Alaska a couple years ago. Sorry, tangent. She is a hundred mile, hundred mile race, marathon. She went 40 miles off track because they don't have people there. So she just went in the middle of nowhere. They flew a helicopter out to get her and said, no, you have to go back. So she turned around, ran 40 miles back, finished the marathon and still beat anyone by two days. I mean, she just destroyed everyone. It's like, God bless her. <laughs> so it's, there's a good, there's a silver lining there to that. But how memories work 
through the hippocampus. So we know memories need to go through there, but they can't be stored there because this guy had memories of everything up until the surgery. So new information has to get through it, but it doesn't stay there. We don't know where it stays. But we do know that anytime you learn something, the first time you learn something, it forms what's called an episodic memory. So this is, imagine you go to, to Paris and you see the Eiffel, this big tall thing for the first time. You have no clue what it is. You never heard of it before. It's just this one off event. At this moment, the Eiffel Tower is tied to this time and place. It's an episode in your life. It is this very specific moment six years ago when I saw that big tall thing. Now, the more you see it, so now you see it on coasters, and you hear about it in songs, and you read about it in books, and you see it on the news, and you see it in photographs. The more places you see it, the more episodic memories you form, what you can start to do is pull out that essential information. You can decouple the Eiffel Tower from any one place in time and say this now stands alone as a fact. And we call those semantic memories. So all new information starts episodic. The first time you experience something, it's just gonna be you and your experience of it. But the more you see it, the more you play with it, and the more varied you get, it becomes, the more you can stand that alone and say, nope, that's not me. There is a thing called an Eiffel Tower. My ninth birthday, episodic. George Washington was president of the US, first president of the US. That's a semantic fact now. I have no recollection of that. That is just something I know. So you can decouple the two together. Always start with episodic becomes semantic. So here's how it works. Let's imagine these are all our episodic memories. Once you're able to get enough of those, you can tie those together to create what's called a semantic memory. And once you have that, then you have a standalone fact. And that only works through exposure and repetition. Semantic memories are the basis of how we then apply skills. So I'm going to play a little game with you. What I'm going to do is I've got four cards here. On the front of each card is a letter, on the back of each card is a number. I'm going to give you a rule. The rule is this. If there is a vowel on one side, there has to be an even number on the other side of that card. If there's a vowel on one side, there has to be an even number on the other side of that card. Your job is to flip over as few cards as you need to prove if that rule is true or false. So here are your cards, and you can talk with those around you. What are the fewest number of cards you need to turn over to prove to me that the following rule is true or false? If there's an, a vowel on one side, there has to be an even number on the other side. So chat with those around you and see which cards you'd flip over to prove it or not prove it. Yeah, yeah. The last half an hour is going to be the opposite of the reflection. Yeah, yeah. We can just gobble up that time. Okay. I would rather you make the connections then rush it and then it's not have as much meaningful stuff as Terry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what are you what are your thoughts? What do you think? Yep. I can is get it, us have we got more to add or what or Yes, what I can do is get us to middle just, through concepts. Just, comes on. just just to try something else out. I wanna play a second game with you. We'll come back to this. This time you're a bartender in a bar. Your bar sells beer and soda. <laughs> the drinking age is what here? 18. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you four cards. On the front of that card, on one side is the age of the person, on the other side is the drink they've ordered. How many cards do you have to flip over to make sure that this order is kosher and that it's okay to be sent out? So on the front of the card is the drink order, on the back of the card is the person's age. Which of these do you have to flip over to see if this order is okay? We're flipping between one and two. What's one that you definitely have to flip over? Beer. Beer. You need to know that kid's over 18. What's another one you have to flip over? Why? Make sure he's not ordering a beer. Do you care what the 31-year-old orders? No. Do you care who orders a Coke? No. It's the same exact question. It is literally the same exact question. <laughs> If there's a vowel on one side, 
There has to be an even number on the other. What's one I have to turn over to make sure it's true? A, I have to see if there's an even number on the other side. Do I care if there's a vowel or not on the opposite side of two? It's not what the rule says. Do I care if it's the opposite of B? What if there's a vowel opposite three? You better take a look. It's the same exact question. Why is this one, how many people are still confused by this one? Why is this so damn tricky, but this one is so damn easy? Reliable. Why is that? It's reliable, it's a real life situation. You have the facts. You have semantic understanding of these things called bars and drinking limits and aid <laughs> and beers. <laughs> Some of us more than others, that's all right. We don't have any real semantic information that A's and two, we know, I've never seen a card that has, and I've had to play this game before. Facts precede skills. The same exact skill you can do in one situation and you can't apply it in another because the facts don't stick with you. This will come back when we eventually someday see transfer, this will come back. So, okay, 10 minutes, you ready for this? Who's ready? We get our facts. Now we get to move into concepts. Once you have your facts, then you can start to build concepts. And another way to put this stage of learning is this, thinking. Once you have your facts, you now need to think about them. You need to play with them. At this stage, concepts, thinking, do you need more facts? Are more facts what you need to start forming concepts? What do you need to do? You need to think. We live in an age where this thing controls the universe and this thing here is predicated on one simple thing. Facts, 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 information, 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 data, data, data. If there's a problem, guess what the answer is? More data. Your kids aren't doing well, guess what you need to do? Get more data. Elections going haywire, guess what you need to do? Get more data. Global warming, guess what you need to do? Get more data. In reality, is more data the answer to any question we really care about? What do we have to do? So at this stage, it's not about giving kids more information, it's about giving them time to play with the information they already have. And this is how you form concepts. So imagine this is our little semantic network. We have dozens of these all around. I have all these facts floating around. What a concept is, is it's how you choose to group those facts. And this is where we come back into chunking. These two facts go together, here's a concept. These three facts go together, here's another concept. If I give you this list of letters, could you all memorize that really quickly right now? What about if I give you the same amount of letters? Why? You have the concept. Once you have concepts, that's how you say, okay, I can slot all these facts together. New South Wales, Victoria, Canberra, all those are states, cool. Concept is things in Australia, states. Couldn't do that without those facts though. Now let's imagine I made a bunch of TV networks called TSB, GMR, TMN, SDLV. Once we knew those as TV networks and had those facts, we could do the same thing here. You can turn it into a concept. Step one, get your semantic facts. Step two, start to form your concepts. To form a concept, there are three stages. The first stage is this. I'm gonna play you a video. All you have to do is follow the instructions. Oh, watch, it's not gonna work. You son of a... <laughs> Boop. I'm enjoying the shit out of it. I, I'm sorry, guys. That is okay. Well, oh, sorry about that. All right, always look behind you. Well, forget that video. The point of that video is as follows learning is interpretive. What facts you have activated determine what concepts you start to form. What you are thinking about is how you start to form your concepts. So if I show you this lovely 100 thread count terry cloth towel, 
And these, oh, sensational L'Oreal Bed Bath & Beyond products. And this warm, lovely shower head. And then I give you this word, what is it? Soap. it why did none of you say soup? Soup doesn't have to do with taking a shower. Bingo. But I was thinking soup myself. <laughs> The idea is what you pre-activate, what you are thinking about is what you form your concepts about. So this is why you've heard people say you have to pre-activate knowledge or you have to activate thoughts or prior knowledge, where are you at? What you are thinking about is how you start to form your concepts. So it behooves us to make sure our students are thinking about the things we want them thinking about. Put them in a, and this is where priming and all this stuff comes in. A number of strategies to do this. I'm, Ideally, we talk about each one, but we just don't have the time, but I'll just let you know. So things like the entry ticket and the advanced organizer, what you do in the first five minutes of your class for your warm up, what you do in those first five minutes will dictate what they think about and how they learn everything after that. We've done this so many times in a lab where we'll give kids the same exact lesson, all will change is their warm up activity. And every kid will learn that lesson dependent on what they did in that first five minutes, even if it has nothing to do with what they're learning. If we have them play a puzzle, that will change the way they learn about the American Revolution. So think really strongly about what you're activating in those first five minutes. No one to learn, blah, 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 blah. Phase two, once you've activated your thoughts, now you have to start elaborating and connecting. And the whole point of this is one simple fact. There is no such thing as a stable concept. Every concept can incorporate any number of different facts you want it to. So this is why we call putting the kids in a pit, where they have to elaborate and connect and change their concepts. So I'm gonna put you in a pit real fast. Are you ready? So this only works with concepts. So here you are right now standing here on the side of your pit. This doesn't work with facts, and I'll show you why in a second. But, so earlier today we did a, a passage on baseball, right? And that was testing our, our, um, our listening comprehension. What is listening comprehension? Somebody tell me. Understanding what you're hearing, so that includes music and dogs barking and dump trucks. Is that listening comprehension? Mm -hmm. Remembering and retaining what you hear. Remembering and retaining what you hear. So it's not just about perceiving it, it's also about putting it deep. Are we still stuck? Is it, does music count, does classical music count as listening comprehension? Making meaning from what we hear. So when we make meaning, do we have to then still memorize it? And does it still, what if I heard an animal I've never heard before and I can't really make meaning of it? Does that count as listening comprehension? Or What I'm doing is I'm forcing you down here. So you're scratching your head. What I've done is you take a concept, and most people will have a pretty clear idea of what they know or what they think they know they mean by a concept. And what you do is you just dig. You use questions to say, really, go further. You get them uncomfortable, and then you leave them alone. And you say, get yourself out of that. <laughs> the only way to do it is to start thinking. And that's where you start to learn that concepts aren't fixed entities. What they are is they're tied to times and places. Yeah, listening comprehension works with meaning when we're talking about words, but it also works with music. It also works with unknown sounds. It works with I, I, Tell me the context you want, and I can give you that concept. And that's what this whole point is, is to try and get them to then start to work. They can help each other come out the other side with a different idea. And the idea is once you start to elaborate and connect ideas, you can take the same concept and say, hey, it's here, but it's also here. And that same concept could also be these guys over here. So first you activate the knowledge, then you have to have them start playing with how do you want to gather that? How do you want to tie it together? What kind of rope do you want to tie around it? In what context? Here's where things like questioning and extending and challenging your thought. Think, pair, share, concept mapping, all that works. The final stage, first you activate the knowledge, then you have to have them play with the knowledge in ways that force them to group it differently. Finally, context and personalization. The last step of conceptualization is making it your own. It's making that concept, that idea, part of your identity. I will not have time to tell you that story, but I will show you.